Hello, David Malone, uh, Golem XIV blog again. Um, this week I want to talk about what happened last week, but not just to run over what we all saw happening, because we all saw it happen. What I like to talk about is things which have been going on in the background, slightly outside of the headlines, which I, I think give us a way of interpreting what happened and more importantly, why. All right, so what we all saw last week was that the stock markets had been shooting down for weeks, um, dropping vertically in last week. Um, and then suddenly, on Friday, all the central banks blinked. Right? So Friday, we saw everything ramp back up. And n nothing had changed economically. Businesses hadn't suddenly discovered a great pot of gold somewhere. All that did happen on at the end of the week was uh, Mr. Bullard of the St. Louis Fed suddenly did a, an, a, an abrupt U-turn and said, well, maybe uh, we should just hold off on this tapering stuff that we've been talking about. Uh, the Bank of England suddenly said, well, maybe we should just uh, not think about putting the rates up. Let's just hang on to the extraordinarily low rates for as long as it takes, really. And the ECB virtually fell over themselves to say, oh, yes, you know, I've been talking about buying, uh, intervening in the market with another trillion euros. Well, I think we should start immediately, possibly Monday, buying a trillion euros worth of um, covered bonds and asset backed securities. So as far as I can see, the central banks had been saying for months, we must get out of these extraordinary and temporary measures. Remember those? 2007, we started some temporary measures. Well, I don't know about your definition of temporary, but seven years is kind of stretching my definition of temporary. Anyway, they'd been saying this, we're going to start tapering, we're going to raise rates, and then they blinked, didn't they? The markets had been going down, and nothing was fixing it and it's got nothing to do with economics with you know with the 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 profit margin of this company or the loans of that company it just had to do with the central banks blinking and saying okay you win and that's where i'm going with this i think what we might look back to what happened last week and see it as a definitive moment a moment when we finished a chapter of this ridiculous ongoing crisis of ours, the one we've been in since 2007, finished one chapter of it and moved on to another. And I think what happened was we, the power balance between the central banks and the politicians who've been advocating the particular set of policies that we've been living with, on the one side, the power shifted from them, I think, quite definitively to Wall Street, essentially, to the private sector, to the big financial institutions. Um, and I think you can see that if you look a little bit behind the headlines. So let's take a look at some stuff that's been going on. It's a bunch of stuff, but I think it all points in the same direction. So let's start with um, junk bonds which in some ways is going to be what the next couple of years is going to be all about, I think. I think we've moved away from sovereign crisis and we're now talking about junk. <laughs> junk, yield and risk. So uh, last week we had this wonderful quote from a man called Stephen Schwarzman, who is CEO of Blackstone, the big um, investment house. And he was asked, well, while all of this turmoil has been going on in the markets, what have, what have Blackstone been doing? And he said um, that their uh, credit unit had been patiently waiting for something bad to happen. You've got to love that quote. I mean, that's up there with Lord Lloyd Blankfein, CEO of Goldman Sachs, talking about doing God's work. I think he put the two quotes together, and Mr. Schwarzman has just told us what the financial God's work is. It's to just stand around waiting for something bad to happen to people so that you can profit from it. And it's the, the bad to happen to what grabs your attention. But I think it's the waiting patiently which is important. The whole policy we've been living under since, well, 2008, 
is the central banks and the politicians aligned with it have said, we're going to do two things, essentially. One, we're going to rein in the terrible risks that the banks have been running. And two, we're going to stimulate growth in the real economy through pumping money in. All right. I don't think the banks were on board with either of these two things, and certainly neither have worked. And I think it came to a head last week. Um, putting stimulating growth, it hasn't happened, has it? There has not been a huge rebound in uh, jobs. There's been some growth in jobs, but they've been low paid and temporary jobs. There certainly hasn't been a, a rebound <laughs> in earnings. In real terms, our earnings have been going down generally. Uh, there hasn't been a, a rebound in the investment in plant and new research going forward. It's just, and we haven't had uh, uh, a rebound in either output or consumption. So, on all metrics, the plan hasn't worked. The only place that has been a rebound is in the stock market. Fantastic, except that you and I don't own it. Stocks and shares, and particularly financial stocks and shares, are largely, very largely owned by the overclass, by the top few percent. So they've been doing fine. So you've got to say to yourself, why not? And the answer seems to me very, very simple. The plan was we'll pump trillions into the market, but we'll do it via putting it in through the private banks. Well, the private banks haven't used that money for investing in the real market. Now, somebody out there is going to be going, yes, we did. Oh, no, we loaned to this person, that person. Just wait a second. We are talking trillions of dollars and euros. Have they invested trillions in the real market? No, they have not. They've invested a paltry little dribble off the side. The rest of it has gone elsewhere, and we'll look at where it's gone. Blackstone has 70 billion sitting on the sidelines ready to buy junk bonds. PIMCO last week said approximately the same thing, that they've been doing the same thing. Um, and let's take a look at what has grown. If you look at the junk bond market, uh, started a couple of decades ago, and it took that time to go from nothing to it was a trillion dollar market four years ago. Between four years ago, which is 08, so 09, 10, and now, it doubled in size. And think about what those years were from 09, 10 to now. In other words, the crisis, when the money was supposed to be being invested in the real market, the junk bond market doubled in, side, in size to two trillion. And at the same time, you had uh, another thing that was growing, the derivatives market. And that's huge. If you look at the figures for America in 2007, the derivatives market was about 130 trillion. That's with a T, not a billion. Billion is last decade. It's a bit old fashioned. Trillion. Uh, it is now, this is just America, about 230 trillion. So between 2007 and now, during the crisis, that market has not quite doubled, but not far short of it. And it's so you tell me where all the money's been going. Has it been going into supporting real jobs in real factories and real growth and real unemployment and real employment? No, it hasn't. OK, that's one thing. We'll come back to it. Um, we had another wonderful thing that's happened um, today. A man called Melvin L. Watt, <laughs> who's director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency, uh, He's giving a speech today out in Las Vegas to the Mortgage Bankers Association, and he's going to unveil several things. He and the uh, real estate uh, section sector and the banks want several things to happen. They want to encourage the banks to lend to people who have uh, low and not very good credit ratings. They also want the banks to now offer people uh, mortgages where only 3% down. That's called subprime. And Mr. Watt is head of the Federal Housing Finance Agency, the people who would be taking those, guaranteeing those mortgages. And what I find interesting is that um, there were quotes, I think this is a piece from Bloomberg, yeah, um, 
someone called Jarrett Seberg, an analyst at Guggenheim Securities. He said, well, yeah, those things are nice, but they, the new efforts don't go far enough to encourage banks to accept lower credit scores. Um, they're positive moves, he said. <laughs> That's positive. Yeah, great. Um, but it's not a game changer. They want something more. And the interesting thing is one of the things that they want is, and that Mr. Watt is going to unveil in his speech today, apparently, is they want an agreement, this is the banks, want an agreement uh, with the FHFA on how, let me quote, some loans can be permanently exempted from the threat of buybacks, said people who didn't want to be identified. What that means is if the banks sell a mortgage and then sell it on, and it's then found that it was such a rotten mortgage uh, that the um, the government, quasi-government organisations like um, Freddie May and uh, uh, Freddie and Fannie, they say to the banks, these were so awful, you've got to buy them back. And this has poleaxed the banks. And so they want now to have a new law which says, uh, if you sign off on these things now, it doesn't matter how badly it goes in the future, you cannot make us buy them back. Okay, now if that gets agreed, that will reignite subprime. So junk bonds, subprime. How's it going in England? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, on Friday, wouldn't you know it, uh, we suddenly had announcements from all the major banks that they were going to slash the rates on mortgages. Uh, one of them, it's a real eye catcher, HSBC, uh, they're going to, <laughs> they've announced uh, a mortgage deal for less than 1%, 0 0.99 of a percent. Um, <laughs> so it looks to me like the UK banks want to get back into um, really low level mortgages. Everybody wants to reignite the housing market, uh, but the housing market as was. Uh, and then there is a veritable army of people who are attacking the the plan, the official plan of reigning in risk at the banks. Uh, we had, for instance, a man called Frank Keating was on Bloomberg this week, um, who's the CEO of the American Bankers Association. And he was arguing, saying, well, the Frank Dodd bill, you know, the, the financial regulation bill, it's about 12,000 pages of nothing. But he's saying, well, I know it was well-intentioned, but do you know what? It's harming the recovery and it's harming the banks and it's harming America. And at the same time, we had another fabulous speech. This was from a man called, again, this is reported in the Washington Times, C. Boyden Gray, who was White House counsel uh, under President George H. W. Bush. And the headline is, Regulatory Overreach Hurting Recovery. And what he's focusing on is that part of Dodd-Frank, which was supposed to regulate over-the-counter derivatives. And he's saying it's a terrible thing. We should do away with it. It's harming the recovery. What recovery remains to be seen. Um, so, and that, those are the derivatives that went from 130 trillion in 2007 to 230 trillion <laughs> this year. Um, if you put those things together, I think what it shows you is that the banks have a very different view of the plan going forwards. They've never really cooperated with the plan, the official plan as was, because they just haven't helped a recovery in the real economy. They've been putting all the money into their own things, junk bonds and derivatives. And there's now an army of people saying, and that's wrong. Your recovery didn't work. And last week, I think, was one of those times when it was proved to the central banks and everybody else that indeed it hasn't worked. The banks, the private banks, are making sure it doesn't work. They've been standing on the side lines waiting for something bad to happen. And I think their plan can be summed up in one sentence, which is risk is back on the menu, boys. They want to be let off the leash. To hell with all this silly regulation. We've never actually taken the too big to fail banks down. They're bigger than they were. The derivatives market is bigger than they were. The junk bond market is bigger than, than it was. Um, and I think the power has shifted now. I think we're going to see going forwards that Wall Street 
and the big global banks are going to say, if you want to get any kind of recovery, especially our kind of recovery, then stop talking about lowering bank risk. Risk is the only thing that's going to work and we know how to control it. They don't, but that's what they're going to say anyway. Um, if I'm right, I think what you'll see uh, with the new lot of money coming into the market is we'll see an explosion in all the things which disappeared over the last couple of months. So I think you'll see, um, well, a huge big growth in junk bonds, without a doubt. Um, so easy money for all of those uh, startups in tech and media where a company you've never heard of does never done anything you've ever heard of. Suddenly it's valued at a billion. Um, I think we'll see um, huge leverage buyouts. Oh yes, leverage buyouts. I forgot to mention that. Uh, that's f fantastic. Leverage buyouts. This is from um, the Liberty Blitzkrieg uh, blog by M Michael Krager. It's very good. Um, the Federal Reserve and Office of the Controller of the Currency last year, which I think is 2013, I think it means, yeah, 2013, uh, they issued guidance saying to the big banks, you must avoid funding leverage buyouts where um, it's more than six times the earnings of the person of the entity you're giving this loan to. So, and what happened? Uh, the banks ignored them. The banks have said, "Oh, you, you, sorry, your guidance wasn't very clear, and because it's not clear, we're just going to ignore it." Uh, so, uh, forty percent of U.S. private equity deals in 2014 have used leverage above that six times ratio, which was declared to be the absolute limit. So they're just completely ignoring it. And I think we'll see more of that going forward. So um, more junk bonds, more leverage buyouts, more um, mergers and acquisitions, uh, more IPOs, those big IPOs, which were all being pulled the last month or so, they'll all be back. I think money, um, big China IPOs, where essentially bubble companies out of China will be floated, hoping that we'll... Uh, our money will get sucked into that. Um, all those things will be back. I think, I think, looking at last week, it was a definitive moment where that plan we've been following, reining the risk, growth in the real economy, has now been stymied. The banks never went along with investing in the real economy. The figures are right there. And they're now lobbying to have all the constraints on risk-taking taken away. And they're winning. I think what's happened is we have just shifted up a gear and we are motoring towards an even bigger blowout because the amount of risk is bigger and the fragility of all of that risk is bigger. And one last thing, which I won't go into because it gets a bit technical, but if you've got a vast um, uh, junk bond market and some people are already saying that um, the junk bonds will blow out essentially um, let's see there's this fellow yeah here you go Martin Fridson um, who's described in this Forbes article so not exactly from the left wing as one of the smartest minds in high yield research this man and it doesn't matter whether he's right or not it's the fact that he's saying it's been reported in Forbes he thinks that um, Nearly $1.6 trillion worth of high-yield junk bonds will default between 2016 and 220. Now, when they default, they're not wiped out completely. Uh, they'll default, he reckons, uh, by about 40% loss of value. She says it's a reasonable guess, uh, which means that you get about a $640 billion loss on that true trillion dollar market. Now, he didn't just pluck those figures out of nowhere. He must have done some sums. If he can do the sums, other people can do the sums. What that tells me is that it won't necessarily all blow out, but that there's going to be a huge push to say, just, we must now insure these junk bonds. Yes, they're risky, but we'll take that, that risk away exactly the way they did with subprime. Oh, yes, I know they're slightly risky, but we've insured them. So now instead of insuring subprime mortgages, although from the other news, they'll be back, we're going to insure junk bonds. And they'll do it via things called um, synthetic CDOs, I reckon, which will be back. Um, and if they're not back, then you'll know I was wrong. And interestingly, I think there'll be one more wrinkle on them. I think they will say to people, 
if you get exposure to these things, if you buy them through ETFs, ETFs that are based on and track those synthetic CDOs, that this will make them super safe and they will draw in um, ordinary investors to invest in these things. Um, and I think, therefore, what we're looking at is a market with a lot more risk, risk that's going to grow hugely in the next two years and a lot more fragile. Have the banks won? Yeah. In the short term, I think they have won. They have definitely replaced plan A with their own plan. Um, do, do they win in the long term? They don't care about the long term. What they care about is the next bonus. I think we're looking at two years where the markets will now sh ramp up. I'm not saying they'll start ramping today. There might be a bit more argy-bargy between the central banks and Wall Street, but Wall Street has the upper hand, and it will go up, I think. Um, and we are then headed for a blowout which will make the one in 2008 look like a sparkler. Anyway, I hope I'm wrong, but um, I don't think I am. Thanks for listening.